the one thing, um, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, having been around a while, uh, the the upside of it is that you see a lot. Um, and I was talking about social mores changing earlier when we did a phone in about housekeeping and what it was like for housekeeping for mostly women when my mum was around and I was a kid. But I've watched this city change as well and watched it go through real slumps economically. I mean, it's probably never been as prosperous, relatively speaking, whether you like the physical manifestations of that prosperity or not it's probably down to you uh, but it's never been as prosperous the the work the building the, the improvement and in my hometown of Salford uh, again you know you might not like gentrification but we were struggling at one point just to keep the town alive and kicking and it's changed the other side of Manchester and Greater Manchester and all the the towns within it, including Salford, is it's got a dark side, a criminal side, and that again has changed when you're looking back to the Quality, quality Street gang uh, back in the 50s and 60s, right through to the Hacienda and Gunchester and beyond. And David Nolan's an author, and he's written a trilogy of Manc Noir novels, uh, and they're now going to be transported to the small screen, uh, and screenwriter Stuart Wright is going to do that. But David, with me in the studio, and great to have you in a very good morning. Hey, mate, how are you doing? And we go back a long way, don't we? We do, we just, it was straight into uh, reminiscence mode there, wasn't it? Well, oh, we, do you remember this, do you remember well, that? Well, we both used to work at Piccadilly Radio together, and... Where did the books come from? Where did the idea for the books come from? I was right, supposed to be writing uh, a factual book about historic abuse in this country and uh, about money and government and power and missing children and this, that and the other. And I'd started writing it, and this would have been my like, 11th book, and the publishers came back to me and said, you know that book you're writing about missing kids and historic abuse? We don't want you to write it anymore. In fact, here's some money to go away. It's called A Kill Fee in publishing so they paid me to not write this book why do you think i well you know if i i believe in chaos not conspiracy you know so i gonna think it's gonna be so much mither this book legally and all the rest of it it'd just be ch cheaper to pay him off and i was so annoyed and so angry and upset and frustrated that i literally started doing this is terrible for radio started doing this ba -ba 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 on a keyboard with my fingers and he's just doing keyboard and finger movements then. thank you very much and um and it was like I, what am I doing here? And I showed it to my wife and she said, why are you writing a crime fiction book? I don't know. Am I? And I, I, I realised that all the stuff that I was trying to say about missing kids and all this uh, in the fiction book, I could do it better. In, you know, I could do it better in a fiction book than I could in a, a real book that lawyers would rip to bits. So that's how it came about. It was an accident. And I'll go back to... Um crime and manchester in a bit and we can find out where your influence are but stuart writes the screenwriter stuart good morning to you thank you for joining us as well good morning and just a quick one stuart it often i know it puzzles me sometimes how somebody like you can get the written word and transfer that to the screen we can all transfer the written word into pictures in our minds that's why we read but to transfer something to the screen successfully, how do you do that? How do you observe and then do that transportation? Um, well, I guess a novel and a screenplay are just two different mediums. And as a screenwriter, what you're trying to do is tell the story visually as best you can. That's the main challenge. And the great thing about Black Moss is it's a very singular story. So we've already got a... a a character to focus on in Daniel Johnson, the, 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 the lead in the story. So as long as we can tell things from his point of view, we as the audience can see that story unfolding in front of his eyes, very much like it does in the book. So in a way, I can still, in, in this instance, I can lean into the book still for a lot of the detail, but then it's about trying to make things more visual than they maybe are on the pages of the book. Right. We've often, though, in fact, I would say nearly all of us, have read a book, seen the film, and said, oh, that's nothing like the book, to the extent that, at its worst, you don't like the film at all, because it's so unlike the book. I think the one that sticks out for me is the girl on the train transported from England to America, and it actually, because of that, doesn't work at all. So how do you avoid people looking at your work and saying, 
Oh, crikey, Charlie, that's not like the book. Well, like I say, it's, it's about it's about leaning into the book, really. If you look at what uh, Tony Crisoni did with the Red Riding trilogy, with David Peace's uh, books about crime over it on the other side of the Pennines, um, he, he did exactly that. And I was listening to interviews with him about how how he achieved it, and I thought, well, that's that, that, that's the way to go. It's sort of if you if you stay true to the book, I mean, and, and that's what attracts me to it. You know, I heard David talking about the book on a on a on a fall podcast of all places, and um, and it excited me then just hearing about that. And then I read the books, and, and and here we are. So for you as the author, let's let's just flip the coin. I wonder what it's like if you're an author. Uh, and you're told that your book would be great for the small or large screen and then find out a film or a TV programme has been made that has, as far as you're concerned as the author, nothing to do with your book whatsoever, either physically or spiritually. How do you make sure that doesn't happen? Well, I'm luckily uh, free at last to the company who are, who are making this, um, who are very well known for like the Agatha Raisin stuff that they do for Sky, uh, and they, they're, they're letting me con sort of be the consultant on the book, so I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be, you know, me and, uh, in fact, over Christmas, me and Stuart had a little tour around Strangeways and the various locations, just so we can get a kind of a feel of it because uh, Stuart's a North Manchester lad you see and I'm South Manchester so uh, he, he got a bit frightened when I took him south of the Arndale you know he got a bit, a bit shaky you know because it was like what's this so you've got to be involved and you've got to be there but it, it's it's scary for me it's a bit like it's a bit like you know someone coming to your house and, and taking your daughter out on a date you know what I mean it's like you're weighing them up and you're thinking oh are you gonna what are you like that's what it feels like where are your influences I mentioned that timeline earlier which I think would make a great podcast from the Quad Street Gang all the way through to the Trouble at the Hacienda, then Gunchester and beyond. How much influence is there for you from those years? Well, I was there, you know, I swear I was there at, you know, for all this stuff, the gun stuff, the Moss Side stuff, the Strange Ways Riot, obviously, um, all the Manchester bombs, you know, I, I was there, I was that soldier. So I've got all of that kind of lurking around in me, in my bones. But there's other stuff as well, there's an amazing film, it's my favourite film actually, called Hell is a City, Stanley Baker film. Great footage of old Manchester there. Amazing. Sadly gone. Amazing. And there's a, that chase across the rooftops on what we, we used to call the refuge building which is called something else now but we'll never call it anything other than the refuge building and also the other stuff was all shot in the hills above Oldham you know at Oldham Edge and all that kind of stuff so Black Moss which is going to be the first kind of uh, d d adaptation is all set in Manchester but also around Delft Diggle all that top end of Oldham which is amazing scenery who are the protagonists so the main the main protagonist is a uh, journalist who's uh, crashed his car uh, into a tree in London, drunk out of his mind, and um, he comes back to Manchester because he's got nowhere else else, else to go. And there's a particular crime that um, has, has stuck in his head that happened during the Strange Ways riot. It's a child murder that happens during the Strange Ways riot, and nobody cares because all the police, all the media, are all focused on that roof. You'll remember, Mike. You'll remember what it I was do. like. Everybody was focused on that roof me included, and it got me thinking, wonder what else happened during the riot that we never reported on? We never touched because it was all about the riot. And um, so that, that, that's the, the, you know, it's a, it's a child murder that nobody cares about. And, um, and, and that's the main thrust of it. And it's, you know, it'll be amazing to see the Strange Ways riot coming to life on screen, you know. Stuart, how do you and David collaborate on this, literally as in sat in a room together talking about what's gonna happen what's not gonna happen um well it's it's not so much as sitting in a room together uh, it's more discussing it in, in in pieces i suppose um one of the things I, I i did while i was in the sort of reading phase was try and identify what i thought the story was i'm trying to adapt for television and and the way i described it to david was if you imagine the way that we dramatize dementia movies it's often about the idea of clinging to memories Whereas what we've got here is a character who has for 30 years drunk himself to forget, as it were. And then when he gets the clarity of being sober, he's now rebuilding his memories as opposed to forgetting them. So it's kind of somebody getting like a refresher 
on what happened during April 1990. So this is being developed at the moment, and, and back to you, David. When do you expect to see this on the small screen? Um, well, if I had my way, it'd be a week on Tuesday, but life ain't like that, mate, as you probably know. Because this is the hard bit now. Going ba 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 with your fingers on a keyboard, that's the easy bit. Writing a book is, is the easy bit. This is the hard bit now that Stuart's doing the you know the, the heavy lifting now with the script of putting cast together and all and the money and all this kind of stuff. that's the hard bit and then hopefully we will get this amazing sort of sight of standing out on the moors above oldham with a flipping film crew and catering and hair and makeup and this that and the other going flipping heck all of these people are out here bringing it to life and that again takes me back to you Stuart because we were talking earlier uh, about housework and people were phoning in about how they divided it between themselves and I got one call and it was I do all the housework and my wife does all the paperwork because she's the facilitator and in a way that is perfect because David is, works with the paper and you then do not just film it and make it work put all of the infrastructure together how much of a task is that for you well, I mean, the great thing is, having written stuff from scratch, having having the books to start with makes life a lot easier because you can kind of know what world you exist in and, and the characters you're trying to build the story around. But I think one of the one of the things that happened early on in the process of us, of realising how this could be effective for television is that David pulled a bit of a masterstroke in the sense of when me and Barry, Barry Ryan from Create Last, went up to meet him, we met on the shores of Black Moss Reservoir. It was a beautiful late summer's day. And we just spent three or four hours chatting there about our ambition and vision for this project. And it wasn't very hard to visualize it because there you are out on the moors. And it's like, it's like you've got what, what we associate with Scandi Noir, you know, that classic TV genre that's been established over the last 15 years. It's on our doorsteps just outside of the city of Manchester. And so we were able to see what the TV show could bring. I think, I think from a production point of view, obviously you've got challenges like recreating the prison riot and even being 1990 period but i think the, the way tv's got at the moment it isn't it isn't so much of a challenge as it once was so i think that we're confident with with the uh, free last that will be okay Stuart, been great talking to you and i want you uh, and david back on the program when this is about to appear on tv all the best Stuart. thank you we and, will do and you as well david Great talking to you. Lovely Great to having you, you in again, the Mike. studio. And again, I want you in the studio when this comes to fruition. You come out on the moors with us.